Who's excited to learn some more? Yes. Who's really excited? Yes. Okay, this session it will be a much shorter session. I'm just going to introduce to you and talk to you about how to be successful in business. Who already is in business for yourselves? Who has a business for themselves? Yep, a few people. Who would like to one day have their own business? A few people. Okay, fantastic. Who works for someone else that has a business? Very good. So I'm going to talk to all of you on how this is important to learn. So what gives me the right to speak on subjects such as business? I've been fortunate enough. One of my passions is I've been called a serial entrepreneur. That's because I've created a lot of companies in my life. Over the last decade or so, I have built over a dozen different companies in a range of different industries. It's, you know, to build a company in one industry and be successful is quite challenging. To be able to build it in multitude of industries and have a large percentage of companies actually be profitable and successful is very difficult to do. So I'm not saying that to impress you, but impress upon you. I built companies obviously in education, I built it in trading, I built it in property, I built it in accounting, finance, broking, stock broking, financial services, media, publishing, and I have a group of rural companies as well okay uh, most of those companies are still owned today there's been about two I think three companies I've sold um, in the past and so I've had a lot of experience in a short period of time of how to build businesses um, many of those businesses you know are million dollar plus companies over eight of them and um, some of them as I said earlier this morning are over 30 million dollar plus companies so I'm not saying that to impress you but impress upon you I'm not a professor at a university talking about how to build successful businesses I'm someone that's had to do it from the ground up now the other unique thing about that is that most of my companies have been able to build um, debt free and self-funded which is even that much harder to do now in saying that I've been able to do that why I also have a speaking career why I'm involved in charity why I'm a part-time farmer as well and doing multitude of things and still have a life. Most people can't manage one career, one business without working all the time and not having a quality of life. I take, if you know anyone that hangs around me, I take regular holidays. I spend, I'm rarely in the office. I'm not changed to a desk and I have freedom. That's even harder to do. I know very few, a lot of people in the world that become wealthy might be able to teach you how to become wealthy, but very few of them can teach you how to do it in a way that's a balanced lifestyle. Because it's not easy to do. So I share that with you. I said not to impress you, but impress upon you. I mean, someone that's been able to use strategies in a way to build businesses that work ideally without you. Does that mean all businesses are perfect? Yes or no? no. There is no perfect business. And the challenge that people have, is jot this down, is perfectionism. In each and every one of us, is, there's a perfectionist. A lot of people think perfectionism is a high standard. Bullshit. Jot this down. Perfectionism is a low standard. And what I mean by that, you say, well, Jamie, you're saying I should be perfect and I want things to be perfect. The reality is things are never going to be perfect. So most people wait for the perfect time or the perfect opportunity. Or I just wanted to, to be right, you know, I wanted the best and the best. So there's a few things I need to introduce you to. One of the things I introduced you to before was the 80-20 rule. Remember I talked about 80% is mindset, remember? And then there was 20% was mechanics or strategies. There is another 80-20 rule. Who can tell me what it is? What's it called? What's it called? 80-20 What is the other 80-20 rule called? Exactly, very good. Pareto Principle, jot that down. So there is another 80-20, it's called the Pareto Principle. Some of you have obviously heard of it, some of you haven't. Pareto um, Principle was created by, it wasn't created by, but become famous by an Italian economist who made it public, etc. Talked about, it's a principle, it's an observation, it's not, a, it's not an actual law, it's just an observation. The ob observation though is very crucial. Most people are too busy making a living that they forget to live. Most people are too busy working to become rich. Does that make sense? One of my mentors said, Jamie, you need to, uh, if you want to become wealthier, you need to be, stop being so busy working all the time. You need to actually take a step back, think, and become rich. Does it make sense? Most people are too busy, 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 busy with activity. But are they really producing it? Because so most people say what they lack is, apart from not having enough what? Money is not enough time. And we need both to have the lifestyle that we want. We need time plus money. So what most people will do to get the lifestyle they want, they will sacrifice what? Time to get more of this. 
and it doesn't work because ultimately they might have more money, but they don't have any more time. They want to spend time with their family or travel the world, have freedom, do what they want, but they've sold their time to get the money. And in Western societies, we create an epidemic where people are chasing for the pursuit of money and they're climbing this corporate ladder and they get to the top and they find the ladder's leaning against the wrong wall. It's not got them to where the lifestyle they want. So we need to do things differently. So what I'm suggesting is a Pareto principle is a very important part. So what I'll be teaching you, I'm launching for the very first time. I decided only a couple of months ago, I said, you know what? There's so much that I've learned off my mentors. There's so much I've learned through building a business or many businesses is that I could share so much knowledge and information that would help a lot of people. I wished when I was studying as an entrepreneur, I could come to a course, sit down with other successful entrepreneurs and they just spill the beans on everything they know. Every distinction, every idea, every concept, how they do it. How do you start a business from scratch and make it a multi-million dollar business? How do you do it with no money? Who'd like to know how to do that, by the way? How do you grow and rapidly grow a company without spending a cent on advertising? Who'd like to know how to do that? Most businesses don't know how to do that. I run a company that will do close to 60, 70, maybe $80 million this financial year, the group, and we spend no more than $15,000 on advertising. That's good. That's very good. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Do you know what I'm saying? Uh, many companies have been built with zero cost marketing. So there's a lot of things that you can do to do that. But these are things that you can learn and apply to any business. Now you say, well, Jamie, I'm not in business for myself. Well, you either in work for someone else or you have your own business, true? In most cases. You need to know this stuff. If you understand this stuff, one of the reasons I was, when I went to work for my mentor, I was able to develop a relationship and work my way up in that company rapidly is because I went and studied marketing. Not at university, but I studied by reading books, going to seminars. Jay Abrahams, who's heard of Jay Abrahams before? If you haven't heard, Jay was one of uh, the first people I studied about marketing. The guy gets paid $10,000 US an hour just to speak to him about business. He has seminars that cost $50,000 to go to. Some of you are thinking, my stuff is cheap, huh? <laughs> but people pay. Why? Because he puts a guarantee on it and because they get such results. I mean, one idea, if you're a business owner, just one idea can quadruple your business, let alone get a 5 or 10% gain. For most people, just a 5 or 10% shift is a lot of money to the bottom line. I'll give you some examples of that in a moment. But if you work for someone else, you need to know this stuff. Because jot this down, this I'll come back to this in a moment. There's two things that you need to do to be successful in life and to be successful in business. Jot it down. Number one, you must add what? Value. You must add value. This should be your organizing principle in everything you do. So adding value is not this. Getting a job because you need the money and couldn't, you don't care about the success of the company. People that are stealing the paper clips and pens at lunchtime. They're waiting for, thank God, it's Friday. You know, some people like that. They're watching. All they're about is what's in it for me. Give me a paycheck. They couldn't care whether the company makes a profit. They couldn't give a damn about the company because they're just into getting. Is that a recipe for success or failure? And a lot of people like that. They wonder why. And they're the same people that are cynical. You can't become rich. Because all life is to about them is to take, take, take and not give. Universal principle tells us this. In order to get, you must first do what? Yeah. Give. So why not base your business, your life, everything you do in your career around universal principles? Is that smart? Based on that because it's long term. So in business and anything you do, it should be based on how can you give and contribute. Who's uh, heard of Facebook? <laughs> now, I highly recommend the social network, the movie that's out about Facebook, to go watch it. Who's had a chance to see it? One, two people? You haven't seen that yet? Three people? Facebook, the Facebook movie that's out at the moment. It's already out, but social network it's called. Now, I'd read the book many years ago about the story of Facebook. It's a fascinating story, but it's a great business lesson. One of the things that Mark Zuckerberg, or Zuckerberg, how do you pronounce his name, um, and you become a billionaire at the age of 24. Okay? Facebook today is valued at $25 billion. Okay? $25 billion. And originally, he didn't create this company to change the world. He didn't go... You know, I'm going to change the world. If you watch the movie, basically, you know, it's dramatized a little bit, but he had a fight with his girlfriend. She basically dumped him, and he'd been drinking, went home, sat on his computer, because he's a very smart computer programmer, and being annoyed and upset about that, he started blogging and bad-mouthing her, basically, on his blog, where everyone in the Harvard University could see, so that wasn't a good move. But it inspired him to, to create um, a social networking tool. 
Now, already when he was at school, he was offered a million dollars by Microsoft for one of the programs he'd created. So he'd already become talented at creating these things. Now, he started the niche, though. People say, some people say, oh, he stole the idea from someone else, etc. You know, the idea was not new. At the time, Facebooks were, you go to Harvard or you go to any college, they, Facebook is at, when you first, the first people come in for the year, they'll get a photo of everyone, put in the, like a yearbook at school. You put a photo in year 12, put a photo in a bit of batch, and that's your yearbook, all the people in your year. That's basically what a Facebook is. However, all the colleges were basically saying, we need, why isn't this online? And all the administrators of colleges getting complaints, is people say, why isn't the Facebook online? Everyone was talking about it. Why don't we put Facebook online? So it wasn't an idea that you had to be, it was freely out. Why doesn't someone do it? The difference is he actually went and did it. Okay? Not to change the world, not to make the world a better place and, and do what Facebook is doing and the shift and it's having on, the, on, on the, the difference in the planet and the information it's making available, organization of information and, and the changes it can make because people can group and create a community. Okay? through the power of Facebook or say connect it with their friends, etc. It wasn't that. It was really just one way for them to meet other girls on campus initially. It was driven by that. And he created the program where they could compare one girl to another and see who was the hottest. Okay? And he created the program late at night and that took off. It got so many hits. It, it, uh, over, um, you know, it affected Harvard's um, server system, made it crash, and then he got called before the board. But out of that, it gave him the idea to then go and start what has become Facebook. And originally, it was just for colleges. Okay? And Facebook grew to 1,000 users, 5,000, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000, and a million, 5 million users, 10 million users, 50 million, 100 million. And today, it has over 500 million users on Facebook. And that will continue to grow, no doubt, to B in and 2 B in, etc. It just come with an idea. Now, but one of the things you'll learn what he did there, he was very strict because he was not about the money. He had a strong vision as it started to grow. He realized, my God, this has massive potential. And his business partner, now the two things you have to have a challenge in business. And the movie highlights the two challenges if you read the book of any business will face. You say, it's not about the money. Well, that's great, but I need money to survive. I need money to pay for server. I need money to pay for staff. So you have these, in business, these two conflicts. So rule number one, you must add value. Rule number two is you must make a what? You must make a profit to have a successful business. So because even if you have a non-profit organization, it still has to make profits. So it's got money to invest into the mission of the non-profit organization. Or in, if it's a profit organization, into the mission of the company and then pay dividends to shareholders. Making sense? So the two challenges that you have in any endeavor is you must add value and you must make a profit. And these are the two things in business you must balance. Some people focus purely on the profit and they're not cared about, they're just after getting, okay? And they're not worried about giving. We know that's not successful long term, is it? Other people are very good at the giving but they have issues with money or charging, etc. And as a result of that, they're making very low or small profit. And as a result, their impact to reach a lot of people is limited because they're not making enough profit to invest, to grow the company and reach people. This is what I'm saying. Okay? And these are the challenges that Facebook grew. They were like, Mark didn't want to monetize it too early. In other words, put a lot of ads on there and you know, they can make money quickly. <laughs> Because he wanted to make it huge and large. And he always said that when it gets really big, it will monetize itself. But he didn't want to affect the integrity of the product. He wanted to focus on the end user that people have the experience they want. As long as that, they get the experience they want long term, it'll be successful. But his business partner who's funding the money has different problems. Because he's like, well, we need money. We've got to fund it. Either we've got to raise capital to fund it until it makes money, which obviously they did or you've got to sell advertising or a combination of that in the short term to pay for it because you can have this great vision. You're going to have half a billion people on the planet using your product, but you're not going to get there if you don't have the money to get there. Who's following what I'm saying here? So these are challenges everyone in business follows. So you must have two organizing principles of the Business Academy program and what we, uh, what we teach you there is add value and make a profit. And that's if you focus on those things. So how do you add more value? We well, got to come up with ideas. If you have a business already, you're going to say, well, we look at your business and say, how do you get your business to reach more of your customers? How do you have greater impact and do what you do, but do better? Okay. 
If you don't have an idea, you might be saying, well, how can I come up with a business idea that works? One of the common things that I get in emails, etc., from people um, all the time is, I've got an idea for a business. Do you think it'll work? Okay. Or I've got an idea for a business. Would you like to invest in it? Okay. So what you can do is you get better at being an entrepreneur, you can usually pick out what will work and what won't. Or you'll see the obvious mistakes. Through my experience, I can see in ideas what the obvious mistakes are and some of the lessons to avoid in business where other people never been through it, they will do. But here's an obvious mistake people make. They spend too much time planning and thinking about what they're going to do and too little time actually doing it. What I mean by that, it's great to have a business plan, it's great to have all those things in place, but what's the most important step in a thousand mile journey? The first step. So what we want to do in any business endeavor, here's a, a clue for you, and we'll go into this detail if you want to come to the business academy, but really what you're looking for is you want to find out as quickly as possible whether your idea will work. You want to test it on a small scale. Jot this down. Test and measure. And any idea you want to do, you want to test it on a small scale, whether it will work before you go and spend six months, 12 months, five years of your life creating this great product or this great business idea. Because a lot of people don't want to find out whether it will work because they're afraid, you know, it's that when they don't know it's work, at least they can justify spending all this time, etc., and being excited. They don't want to risk failure. So they're avoiding whether it will work. You don't want to waste time. I want to know if something's going to work pretty quickly before I'm going to put any time, money, or energy into it. Now, how will I find that out pretty quickly? One, through experience, but two, pretty much understand this. Any business that you want to start, any idea that you might have, has probably already been done. Make sense? Somewhere on the planet, it's probably already been done. Or something similar. Just like with Facebook, there was other types of networks that had started, social networks. Social networking was invented as a term back in 1960s, Department of the U.S. Defense Force. They have a department there that people that are very intelligent that have to predict future trends. And back in 1967, um, some of these professors predicted what would happen in the future with social networks. That that's the way eventually it would be online computers, people would, people would communicate that way. Way back then. Okay, so it's not, they say everyone comes up with at least one idea to make a million dollars in a lifetime. Who's sort of seen an idea that you've had and other people have actioned it and had a successful product out of it? Everyone knows an idea and other people implement it. It's not, you don't necessarily have to have the idea. Bill Gates, one of the wealthiest people on the planet, was MS-DOS his idea, yes or no? no. He bought it for about $50,000, someone else's idea. He had the vision though to take action with it and to build a business out of that. Does it make sense? So it's not so much the idea. The world belongs to people that can action ideas. So if you want to find something that will work, one of the first things what you should do is look at things and go, you know, this is what I tell people. Has it been done before? Or is there something similar? So whatever your idea, whatever your business is, has it been done before? Generally there is. How will you find that? Google. You can Google pretty much everything. So Google and do some research. Find is there websites, is there companies that have done something similar to what you want to do? Because the shortcut to success is to find a what? A model. You're looking for a model. It's easy to find a model of something that's similar or been successful already and then to say, my idea is going to be to improve that or do it slightly different or do it this way to improve on the model. Because you're starting some at success. You're starting up here. And then you're just going to improve it. Better than starting down here with an idea that's unproven. Most people waste so much time, money, and energy on unproven things. You want to test. I, when I launch new companies, we test on a small scale. We want to test on a small scale. Because why are we going to spend too much time or money if it's not going to work? We want to know as quickly as possible, will this work before we commit more resources to it? Plus, you want to test because you don't want to grow a company too quick either. If you grow a company too quick, that's, you know, grow, grow, die is a common analogy. So you always want to test if it works on a small scale, okay? Here's what most people do. I had people come to my seminars before from years ago. They go, Jamie, I took an idea from one of your seminars. I've gone out and bought a couple of investment properties. They've gone up in value. Things are great. What should I do next? What should you do? Exactly. Repeat the pattern. Repeat the pattern. If you repeat that something's working, repeat the pattern. Okay? If something's not working, what should you do? 
Exactly. Stop. Most people are told, Jamie, I've been told I've got to be persistent to be successful in life. So they'll persist at doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting a different result, which is the definition of what? Insanity. Insanity. So if something's not working, what you've got to have, jot this down, you've got to have acute senses. Well, another word for that is sensory acuity. To be successful, you have to have acute senses of what works, what's not working. To notice what's working. Like in your investment strategies, you're to notice what's working, what's not. Okay, the difference between making 100000 a year, a quarter of a million dollars a year, a million dollars a year, $5 million a year, it's fine-tuning. People that make $5 million a year don't work you know, 5,000 times harder than people making $50,000 a year. Some of you say, I don't have enough time. It's not about time. It's about organization of your time and being productive in what you do with that time. It's about what value you add. So here's what I'm going to suggest to you. If you're in most cases in this room, if you're not making as much money as you would like right now, I'm going to suggest something to you, that you're not adding enough value to society. Read after me. Hmm, something to think about. If you want to create more wealth in business or in your career, or in anything you do, you need to say, how can I add more value? Now, one of the ways you're going to do that is develop your skill set. And there's certain skills you need to have that will help you add more value. Now, there's some exceptions to that. You can work in for some government departments and it doesn't matter how much value you add, you'll get paid pretty much the same. If you're a school teacher, you're pretty much going to get the paid the same as all other school teachers. And God help if they, you know, they're trying to change that where top teachers will be rewarded more. And there's the rest resistance to that idea. Okay, it's communism, socialism. In socialism, everyone gets paid the same. This flawed philosophy that everyone is equal and everyone should earn the same amount of money. Sounds good in theory, doesn't it? That everyone will have food and house and shelter. How does it work in reality? Those who ever grew up in a communist country, does it work too well? No. We know some ex-communist countries, it doesn't work too well. Um, so what I'm saying is that those in society that want to earn more, achieve more, be more, should be given that opportunity to do so. And it's people striving for more is what increases our economy and creates more jobs that makes things happen. So whether you're ever going to be in business for yourself, I'm going to suggest this. Some of you are better off never going into business. Do you want the truth? Yeah, it's truth. Actually, many of you would be better off not going into business for yourself. You say, well, Jamie, I thought you were going to be teaching us about business and business academy to teach us how to be great entrepreneurs. The reality is not everyone suited for being an entrepreneur. Not everyone will be good in business. That's the reality. Some of you would be far better being entrepreneurial, jot this word down, entrepreneurial managers. Because what do successful entrepreneurs need that have companies that have the vision, have the product, have the idea? What they need is good quality people to run those businesses, to grow those businesses. If you work in a company, if you can develop the skill set to be an entrepreneurial manager, you can actually make as much money, or in many cases, more money, than the people that own the businesses. Kerry Packer, when he was alive, used to get annoyed that his executives that run some of his companies were buying up houses in the same street as where he lived in Sydney. So how can this be? Because in the past, you know, 100 years ago, the owners of companies were rich, the workers were not so rich. These days, many managers and executives make just as much, or if not more, than the owners of the company or the shareholders of the company. Making sense? So if you can develop the ability to do, understand business and learn these skills that I'm teaching you, you can be a far more a valuable employer, employee. Sorry. And you can renegotiate your structures with the things that we teach you so you can take a percentage of the pie. So you become more performance related, not just salary. Because if you're selling your time and that's all you're selling, you're never going to make it if that's all you're selling. And even if you do make a lot of money, you still have to be there to earn it, so you're not going to have the quality of life that you want. So you've got to rejig that. Do you understand what I'm saying, though? No? For some of you, you'd be better off getting better at understanding these skill sets. Why? So you can go back to your employer and add more value to the company. And then you can be rewarded in that. And that's what I did when I started well, working for my mentor. I say, how can I add more value? And I put propositions as I built the relationship of how I could... Two ways you add more value or add more profit to a company is one, increase its revenue 
and two, decrease its costs. It's not, this, it's not that complex. You've got to help the business increase its revenue and decrease its costs. So through our business academy, it's what we'll be looking at, saying if you own a business right now, how do you increase your revenue and decrease your costs? If you work for a business, you should be focused on that because then you can participate in more profit if you get good at that and you can be rewarded for an increase in sales or rewarded for an increase in profitability of a business. And if you can't negotiate something where you work, you can earn that somewhere else. Except if you work for the government. Okay? There's different rules apply. However, do many government agencies outsource now and take on consultants, etc.? We can make a lot more money. Okay? Now, some of you that are entrepreneurs need to, if you own your own business, need to actually start being the entrepreneur and stop managing. Because usually you have a skill set that's good at one. The times in my companies where I've learned to stop being the manager and start being the entrepreneur and, let, and bring in people that are better managers than me is the companies have gone to new levels. Richard Branson. Is Richard Branson the world's greatest manager, yes or no? No. no? no, nowhere near it. But he's the world's greatest entrepreneur. So should Richard be micromanaging every one of his businesses or should he be the entrepreneur coming up with the ideas and setting the vision? Should be the entrepreneur. Okay. And that's where he can add most value to organization. So Richard uh, has focused on PR because he enjoys that a lot. He focuses, he comes up with the idea. He's able to assess quickly whether an idea will work or not. He's responsible for helping put the team together, giving them the vision. Sometimes the venture capitalist, the funder. Because basically the Virgin Group is a venture capitalist group, if you're not aware of that. It's a branded venture capitalist group. Most of the companies are started because people come with ideas to Richard. They come with new ideas. You know, you travel with him to the airport. I can remember in Los Angeles a few years ago with him at the airport. As soon as we got off the plane, he's swamped by people. Entrepreneurial people, they're trying to pitch to Richard their business ideas. Okay? He's a venture capitalist. He has a whole board in place where ideas are submitted and they'll look at and dissect and they'll take ideas on. They'll put some capital into it maybe and they'll brand it as a virgin company. You might know a little company that was just an idea on a napkin. It's called Virgin Blue. Little airline company, Brett Godfrey, used to work for a Virgin airline company in, the, in, the, uh, in Europe and he came up with an idea and he pitched and pitched and he eventually got it through to Richard Branson to say, here's my idea, we should start an airline in Australia. We could be the third airline. Now, anyone knows history, what's happened to all the third airlines in Australia? They've all failed miserably. So it's not an easy pitch. Brett eventually convinces Richard to put $10 million in C capital. Richard just writes out a check for $10 million. Trust Brett, and they launch Virgin Blue. $10 million C capital. Richard obviously gets most of the company because it's his money. Wouldn't happen otherwise. Now, obviously, you might say it's luck or timing or whatever. It was just before September 2001, and ANSET went under. Remember, before the... Um, and set went under. So the number two airline disappeared. They were a small company, had just started a few months before that, and were building up. And they'd actually been offered a lot of money by um, Singapore, I can't remember, Singapore Airlines, because they owned part of Anset and they didn't want a competitor. I think they offered something like $100 million to Richard to shut up shop. Basically, they're going to take over Virgin Blue and just shut it up because they didn't want competition. And he said no to it. Imagine that. You put $10 million in, you got a very short time later, someone offering you $100 million. That's a pretty good deal, is it true? Yeah. But he wanted, he's like, no, we put all this effort and Brett's saying we can't do it because we've, you know, we've hired these staff, we've made these commitments, I've made all these promises, we, must, we can't sell, we must deliver. So they didn't sell. And long story short, that Virgin Blue grew to be a successful company. Uh, was listed on the stock market, had a market value in excess of $1.5 billion. Richard Branson made a billion dollars out of that $10 million investment in less than four years. Raise your hand if you like the idea of that. Okay. See, if he was too busy being a manager, would that happen, yes or no? Brett was the manager. Brett was an entrepreneurial manager and the other team part of the Virgin crew that managed and grow that. As the entrepreneur, doesn't even have to have the idea, but has to put the team together, sometimes put the capital in, and is the visionary for what can happen. Okay? Doesn't mean Richard doesn't know the intricate details of how to run an airline business or a lot of his companies. He actually does. He's on the ball. He knows intricate details. 
but he's not in their day-to-day man. He has to learn to do something that's very powerful that most people can't do. And that is, jot this down. And this is why most people are not billionaires. Because to be successful in business, it's a slightly different mindset to being an investor. Before I was teaching you about how to become a millionaire, had the millionaire psychology to be an investor, to be an entrepreneur, it's a slightly different mindset. Very few people on the planet are successful in business and investing. Those who are successful as entrepreneurs are usually good in business, but never focus on being an investor. But it's just a learned skill. I've been fortunate to learn both skills, but I've had to go out and learn that. Okay? So um, the key what... You want to jot this word down. This is one of the reasons why most people are not as rich as they can be. They have to know how to delegate, and most people cannot delegate. You either have money at work or you have what at work to become wealthy. People at work. Jot that down. Richard Branson is a multi-billionaire because he has a large amount of people at work for him throughout his companies. To do that, you need to be able to get leverage and delegate. And this is where most people fail miserably because their attitude is, well, I might as well do it myself because at least I know it'll get done. Who knows some people like that? Who knows some people like that intimately? Okay. (laughs) And this is part of the challenge because we all have this control freak, uh, a perfectionist within us. At least we get the job done properly. I understand. The greatest challenge in business is to be able to train, to have to delegate, to rely on other human beings. My first mentor said, Jamie, running a business is pretty much like running an adult daycare center. Actually worse. An adult daycare center, you get paid to look after them. Here you have to pay them. Okay, to run amok. So the other thing you need to be to be financially, to be successful as an entrepreneur, jot this word down, you need to be flexible. If you're not flexible, you're going to get bent out of shape. One of the reasons most people are not as wealthy as they like to be is they're too inflexible. They can't handle things going wrong. Do you think if Richard Branson was inflexible, he could be successful to the level that he is? Yes or no? How many things are going wrong in any of these companies at any given time, at any given moment? So many things. If he worried about every little thing, he, he just, he'd be stressed out. So you have to be able to be flexible and accept things will not always go to plan. Things will not always work the way you want. So if you want a perfect business, then guess what? It's not going to happen. Is a virgin company successful as they are? Is virgin always perfect at delivering what you want? Yes or no? No. Who's a virgin fan? Who's a fan of virgin? Okay. A lot of people in here, raving fans. As much as you love the companies, there's sometimes... It's not a perfect service. That's life. So if you think you have to have the perfect business to be successful, then you're not understanding it. Because there is a discrepancy. And this is what you've got to understand in life. There's a discrepancy. If we are a client of a company, our expectations are up here. If we go and a consumer of a company, etc., we have an expectation very high. But in our own life, in our own, if you have your own business or your own career, what you deliver often is down here because we know the world is imperfect. We would like it to be as perfect as possible, but the world is not perfect. So what people demand and expect of other businesses that they're a client of is a higher expectation than what their own career or business is. Just like if you wanted to sell your house, The price you want your house, if you're selling it for, is higher than the price you would pay for it. True? If you're trying to buy it, you'd be trying to get it for a lower price. There is a discrepancy. When you want to sell something, you want a higher price. You want to buy it, you want it at a low price. If you're a customer of a company, you have a high, high expectation. You want it to be perfect. Otherwise, you complain. But in your own career or your own business, you know it's not realistic to be able to always deliver at that level because... We're dealing with humans. Who's following what I'm saying here? Okay. So my point is this. You do not have to be perfect to be successful. Some of you should be going, thank Christ for that. Okay. Because stop having that element of perfection. You're never going to get there. Apple. Is Apple computers? Well, it's not even Apple computers. It's Apple Inc. Is that a successful company? Yes or no? One of probably the most successful companies on the planet. Who's ever had an Apple product that's broken down before? Okay, they all break down. How often does the iPod and the iShuffle, etc., stop working? 
You just go and buy another one, don't you? You're just like, because does it stop you being a raving fan of Apple though? People queue up for their products because they're great products, even though they fall to pieces half the time. They're not perfect, but they're so good. You're such a raving fan. You'll put up with the fact that they're not always perfect. Does it make sense? Because they've developed a relationship with you. They create such cool products that you want. You'll put up with the imperfections. And that's why they've been so successful. Okay? So my point is, there is no perfection. You don't want to do that. You want to have the highest standard you possibly can have. But there will be things that always go wrong. Why? Because to be successful in business, you have to rely on other people. Okay? And people are generally unreliable. Who's found that to be true? So I'll just do it myself. So to be an entrepreneur, you have to learn how to delegate, train, articulate, and rely on other people to do the job. And a lot of people just can't do that. They just freak out because they know. And that can be very expensive and can be very difficult. Am I saying it is easy to build a large team of people and have quality managers, etc.? That Well, I'm not saying it's easy. It's not. But the rewards are massive in business and financially if you get it right or if you get it right to some of the time. So there's skill sets that you can learn about that. And there's a lot of people out there that have those skill sets. So if you want to be a budding entrepreneur, you need to learn the skills to be a successful entrepreneur. And if you're already in business for yourself, you need to, you need to learn the stuff that's been taught at Business Academy, period. If you have your own business, you, if you don't know this stuff, you're screwed, basically. If not in the next 12 months, you will be in your business because you need to have this level of knowledge. Otherwise, how are you going to grow your business? How are you going to adapt? How are you going to change? How are you going to get it where it operates without you? Okay? Most people think they have a business, but if they stop being there, the business falls apart. Does it make sense? Because it's dependent upon them. They haven't learned to delegate. Okay? So, there's things now. If you work for someone else, you say, well, I want to start my own business one day. Well, you want, it's handy to know how to do that before you start as far as what's the most common mistakes people will make. Um, how to identify and work out as quickly as possible what businesses are likely to succeed. How to pick trends. How to pick industries that are go growing. Okay? Or how to change things. Okay? Um, where if you're, an if you're a manager or work in a company, say how can you add more value to the company you work for and take a bigger slice of the pie? How can you get paid more money? Okay? And you'll be surprised at how much you can make as an executive if you know what you're doing. Okay? Because in business, it's easy if you can develop these entrepreneurial management um, skill sets. I know for some of you this is a little bit advanced for you, but if you can learn how to manage and grow businesses, it's easier. It might take 10 years for an entrepreneur to take a business from zero to say $30 million, as an example. If you know how to grow businesses as a manager or an executive, it's far easier to take a $30 million business to $100 million. A lot less effort but a much bigger result. And you take a slice of that pie. That's how executives make millions and millions of dollars. Um, CBA, CEO, makes how much? S too much, yes. <laughs> $16 million. Okay. Why do these executives get paid so much? Okay. At the end of the day, they're managing businesses. They work for the shareholders. If they're managing business and get a result, okay, and increase the profitability of that company, then they deserve their big salaries. If they're not and they're losing the company money, then that's when the issue is why should they be getting paid a large amount of money? Okay? They still want to be paid X amount because that's just the demand that there is. Because the skill set to do this is a high level skill set. So if you can learn how to do that sort of stuff and get that experience, you'll get paid a lot of money. Now you don't have to be managing a billion dollar company. How many businesses out there that need quality people? You talk to people, most companies, what's their biggest problem? Can't find quality staff. Be a quality staff, be a quality manager, and the opportunities abound everywhere in what you do by understanding these things. Let me give you a quick analogy of why, what you can do in business to make a difference. My mother, many years ago, decided to start. She was bored. She got a job working in the coffee shop in town. She was working in the business, getting a steady salary every week, enjoying it. So then she decided she would buy the coffee shop. Instead of doing things that I teach people at Business Academy, because I didn't have it back then to teach her, um, 
where you can buy businesses no money down. Who likes the idea of buying businesses without any money? There's ways you can buy businesses no money down. I bought a company several months ago. I was in holidays in Bali and um, it wasn't, I didn't buy the business, but I was on holidays in Bali. I was finalizing the contracts to buy a business in New Zealand, um, pretty much no money down. Okay? Um, there's ways to do that with using vendor finance, using different, different ways to go about doing it. Okay? So even if you don't have capital, or even if I do have capital, why am I going to pay cash out for it if I can get it no money down? It takes the risk away for me. Okay? So I prefer not to pay cash. So I generally build businesses, but I have acquired um, several companies, and you know, that requires capital. So my mother outlaid and borrowed money to buy the coffee shop. I can't remember the exact figures, but let's say it was about $100,000. They offered at the time the opportunity to buy the building that the coffee shop was in as well. But dad declined because he considered debt to be bad. It was, let's say it was another $150,000 to buy the building. It was a fairly small building um, for the, where the, build, the business was in. He declined to do that because he didn't want any more debt. Okay. Mistake, really. Which debt would you rather? The hundred grand for the business or the hundred and fifty grand for the, the actual building? Because if you could have bought the building, what you do, and this is what I do when I buy commercial buildings, I've got companies, you can put your companies into them. And guess what I do to the rent? You put the rent of your building up straight away. Why? Because commercial buildings are valued on the <coughs> largely ninety percent based on the rent. So if I increase the rent that my trust will charge to my companies that needs office space, then by increasing the rent, I increase the value of the building. Repeat after me. Hmm, something to think about. So you can buy an asset, especially when buying assets through the credit crisis, you can buy distressed assets, okay? And you jack that, you can increase the value of the building. You could even then sell the building for a higher value because you have a locked in tenant, even though it might be one of your own companies that's gonna pay the higher rent. You can pay the higher rent for X amount of years, but you've made a lot more on the capital growth of the building, so you can make money anyhow, but that's just something else. So the point is they could have bought this as well and bought the building. They could increase the rent and increase the value of the building and made some money out of thin air. Then they could sell the building off if they wanted to at a higher rate. So anyhow, long story short, mum uh, building a coffee shop, she was an employee. Thought, I know how to run a coffee shop, but when you start your own business, you have to then worry about all the other things. Okay? Now she's working harder, she's got the stress because she has to make enough money to cover overheads and if anything's left, she gets some. So it's taking up a lot amount of time and the passion and the joy for it is now disappearing because it's becoming quite a headache, it's quite stressful, especially you're not making a lot of money from it as well, it gets challenging. Okay? So I said to I said, look, this is what I would do differently, it's up to you, but it, you know, this is what I would do. The first thing I would do to fix that business is this. The business was doing... Let me work out, I'm going to guess the numbers, but about $15,000 a week in takings, okay? So the first thing I said what you should do, let me jot this down, this is what most people should do. The reason most people are not making the money they want is one, they don't charge enough for their time. They don't feel worthy, they have issues with money, they feel if I charge more then maybe people won't love me. Make sense? Or well, maybe people say whatever, they won't love me. Okay? That's basically what they say at subconscious level. They're not confident in their own product to say, this is what I'm going to charge. So, as a result of that, um, she wouldn't put the prices up. So I said to her, here's what I would do. If you, I was working for you, this is what I would do as a consultant, and this is what I'd do if I own the business. So the difference is some people will struggle in business, but others can come in, same business, same industry, and do well from it. What do I know about running a coffee shop? Nothing. But as an entrepreneur, do I need to know anything about running a coffee shop? Nope. Because you can learn that if you need it to, but I'm not going to, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm not going to work in the coffee shop if I wanted to own it. Why would I? Because I'm managing that and I'm not going to make the money. As an entrepreneurial investor, I'd say, here's what you need to do, mum. You need to put your prices up 10% across the board immediately. Put up by 10%. So if coffee was $3.50, it's now going to be what? $3.85. But I said, Mum, you probably won't do this because most people won't do it. Okay? But this is what I would do if you want to change your business. And this is what you should do in your own business. But Jamie, I work for someone. If you should charge 10% more immediately, what does that mean? You should charge, your, you should increase and negotiate for a pay rise. 
Your salary you get is your business. That's you. Most of you don't charge enough. The amount of people I've had, I've inspired and motivated through seminars, have just gone out and there's a particular strategy we teach. Um, and the Internet and Business Home Study, actually, it's in the Internet and Business Seminar. It's part of your membership. So um, one of those strategies is how to get a pay rise. The amount of people have left the seminar, used that strategy, increased their pay instantly. Okay? It happens time and time again. If you're adding value and good, you can easily get a pay rise. Why? Because, face it, for a company to recruit someone to replace you, do they pay recruitment fees? Yep. Are they cheap? I started the recruitment company purely because the amount we used to pay to recruitment companies was outrageous. There's a trend for you. If you want to start a business in a good industry, you'd be like, recruitment. There's so much money to be made in it. Okay. It's ridiculous. Ridiculous. Why do people just pay it? Because what's their choice? Companies need good people, so they will pay recruiters good money to recruit them. So you have to pay recruitment fees. You have to pay retraining costs. For all that, if you're a good employee, it's not worth the headache. It's cheaper to give you five or ten grand pay rise than lose money by recruitment, etc., and doing all that. So often people get pay rises, but you've got to go about it in the right way. You've got to present how you're going to add more value to the company. Remember, to make more profit, you've got to add more value. You've got to pitch it what's in it for them. It's not what's in it for you. To get what you want, you must figure out what they want and give them what they want and increase the chance of getting what you want. Does it make sense? It's all about a negotiation. So long story short, now, by putting up prices by 10%, here's the magic of what can happen in business. Okay? Mum was probably struggling at the time to make $500 a week, not even get a salary back that she had when she was working for the business before, before she could do this. Now, the reality is, I said, Mum, you put your price up by 10%, most of your customers won't even notice and they won't even care. And the ones that do and can complain, they'll go elsewhere, which is exactly what you want to happen. Let them go elsewhere and send your competitors broke, selling them coffee or whatever at such a low price, you're not making any money. I said, if these people in the community knew that you're struggling making bugger all, delivering them a service, most of them would gladly pay more money because they feel that why, you know, they, they don't, you know, it's not a charity. You've got to be able to make money by what you're doing. Otherwise, you've got to value your time. Otherwise, why are you doing it? Making sense? This is what I'm saying here. Put your price up by 10% in this example. Guess what happens? 10% pretty much would lose no business. Extra 10% on turnover is about $1,500 a week. Now, a large percentage of that is actually profit because the rent's already paid out, the takings, everything else is paid, apart from some food costs. Let's say $1,000 of that because the extra part is where all the profit is. $1,000 of that is profit. She's making $1,500 a week. If she makes an extra $1,000 a week by simply putting her prices up by 10%, her profit has now increased to $1,500 a week. She put prices up by how much? And how much has her profit increased by? $500 to $1,500 is how much? 300% to the bottom line. Repeat after me. Mmm something to think about. When we're talking about business, you only need a minor two of changes in some places and it makes an exponential change in the bottom line. Most people don't charge enough. Okay? By her charging enough, making money, is she going to be more excited about the business? Is she going to be more passionate and more able to be more creative about improving the products and services because she's not worried about going broke all the time? Is she able to maybe afford to hire better quality staff or spend more time training? Okay, so I'm not saying just put your prices up and be a, a rip-off merchant. I'm saying add value, improve your product, be proud of it, make it even better. And then you can charge for more. Because do people just want cheap, cheap, cheap? Yes or no? Yeah. Some do. Okay, and if you're in the business where you're dealing with cheap, 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 get out of the business, move to another industry. If all you're competing on is price, then you set yourself up for failure from day one. Change what we do in that case, if that was my, you're in an industry like that, change your business so you're not pitching based on price. A USP, jot this down. USP, Jay Abrahams taught me this. USP, who can tell me what it stands for? Unique selling proposition. Make your business unique. Thus then you don't have to compete on price. Then you don't have to compete on price. So make it unique. If you're saying, well, Jamie, I can't put my price up. My competitors will undercut me. That's your problem. You set yourself up for failure. You need to make your business unique.
Okay? Otherwise, cheap and nasty. You know, one of the reasons why America's economy is declining and crashing is because the age of bargains. Everyone's competed to the lowest level. It's good for us consumers to get things cheaper. But do you always want cheap and nasty or do sometimes you want quality? Let me ask this question. Guys, if you're going out on a date and you want to impress a lady, do you guys want to take it to McDonald's? <laughs> well, no, the meals are fairly big. It's cheap. It's going to save me money. Is it going to work? Is it going to get you the result, folks? <laughs> you will go, probably not, okay? Now, you don't want to go to the other extreme and impress them too much because then you set too high expectations, okay? <laughs> So you have to like, you know, you have to work that out how you do that. But if you want to impress someone, you want a quality experience. You don't care if they're going to be looking at the price. You, pay, you want to pay more because you want a quality. You notice the most expensive restaurants in the world? You get the smallest meal in the world. <laughs> you get the cheapest restaurants in the world. Have you ever been to Denny's in America? You know, for $3.95, your breakfast is this big. Okay, three weeks later, you're still trying to digest it. Okay. So you want a quality experience. So people aren't just after cheap, cheap, cheap. People want quality. People will pay. They'll pay more whether you're a consultant or your employee. You deliver quality. If you're in business for yourself, deliver something different, unique, and added value, people will pay more for it. Why? Because we all want better experiences. Is it true? Money is not always the consideration. In some cases, it might be. If we're competing just one TV that's identical from somewhere to another, yeah, maybe price, but even then, you know, it's often convenience or what we want. So don't get into that trap of you can't charge more. Add more value and charge more. Enjoy your business and start adding and creative and adding more to what you do. And that's the key. A 10% increase there can make a 300% difference to the bottom line. Now, that's just one of a dozen strategies I can teach you that you can go through a business and dramatically improve the quality and profitability of a business. People that have done this have been able to increase their um, profits rapidly. One... Um, I was saying one 19-year-old kid, one of the things that we'll teach uh, in Business Academy as well as apart from how we'll go into also how about buying businesses, etc., um, but also capital raising, okay? Now, it's a little bit advanced and for most of you, only, I won't go into too much detail, I'll just give you an overview of it quickly. But there's a few things that you can do in business. One, ultimately a business should be built to sell it. You should begin with the end in mind. So you should be thinking, okay, how am I, what ultimately am I going to do with this business? Okay. So when I sit down with a lot of my business partners, we will have like a two, three, five year goal and say, okay, this particular company, in five years, we might want to exit. We're going to build this company up to do one. We're going to sell it, okay, for X amount of value, X times multiple, uh, which is the terminology we understand as a share investor, um, X times what its earnings are, its profits. And we want to either sell the whole lot in what's called a trade sale. Jot this down. So you, different ways you can sell a business. I'm just about out of time, so I'm, otherwise I'll be here for three days teaching you the Business Academy. Okay. Who has an interest in learning more about business and things like that? Who has an interest in getting paid a lot as a manager to manage other people's companies? Okay. Who would like to start a business one day? What was I up to? Trade sale. So different ways you can sell a company. One, you can trade sell it. You can IPO it. Okay, these are your different options. What's a trade sale? You find another company who wants to buy it and you sell it, generally to a bigger company. IPO it. IPO stands for what? Initial public offering. So it's a company that's being floated, is another word, floated on the stock exchange for the first time, where you can buy shares in it. There's a particular company in Queensland right now that's being floated. Who can tell me what it is? QR. QR. How much advertising are they doing to try and get that float away? It usually gives you a good indication they're struggling to get the float away. <laughs> I'm not going to upset your premier by saying anything about it, but I'm not going to be investing in QR, okay? Not that I'm saying it's not a bad company, but it's really not that exciting, okay? It's not that exciting. What they're doing is getting a lot of capital to pay down their debts and fix the state's budget up, basically. IPO, so that's initial public offering. Companies that list like that, you can do very well out of IPOs, okay? But in recent times, IPOs, Coles Mine, some of them just haven't performed. So the market gets, they, de they have to lower the price, otherwise the market's not going to buy them. Um, so all you can sell, part, you can, um, different ways you can license your company, 
and sell off licenses. You can franchise your company and sell your, your company in, P, in different bits. Okay? Or you can divide a company up and sell off parts of it. Okay? I'll give you an example of that in a moment. Um, so, or you can sell part of your company. You can take on you know, cornerstone investors or you sell part of it. You might take on a 20% investor. You might sell 20% of the company. Or you can also do what's called gradual sell down. You gradually over time sell a percentage of the company off over time. A lot of businesses in Australia are going to be on the market. Baby boomers over the next five, ten years will be selling most of their businesses as they move into retirement. Many of them will struggle because they don't know how to build their business, make them profitable, attractive to investors. Okay? As an investor, you can also use business strategy where you can buy businesses, have someone run them, okay? have someone run them uh, as a passive, and you can, you're a passive investor. They run without you. Okay? There's a lot of opportunities with that. I'll give you an, uh, an example of that in just a moment. Okay? So that's how you can go about doing it. One way, I'll, let me teach you a couple of things. One way you can raise money. There's different ways you can raise money in Australia. You'll generally need either a prospectus to raise money. It's an, uh, an ASIC approved document. It might cost you an area from fifteen, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 plus to get a prospectus done. And that's just basically an official offer document. Okay, which means you can go out to the public and offer anyone shares in your company via prospectus. Outside of that, that's fairly expensive for a lot of people, and only you're going to be doing a larger capital raising. You can do things such as a 2012 rule, some of you are familiar with that, where the ASIC rule basically is that you can have a maximum of 20 investors in any 12-month period as long as you don't raise more than $2 million. Okay? So you basically 2012 rule, which means you still would have an offer document, a properly planned um, offer document that's compliant that you can make available to people. So there's a combination of different things to do. I myself have never listed as an IPO. I was going to list some of my companies before the credit crisis, had done the full scale, everything through, bought in place, uh, investors ready to go, and then we pulled the offer doc as soon as the credit crisis hit because the share market collapsed and it was just wasn't worth doing. And I'm actually glad that it didn't go ahead. Because then when you sell your company, if you're only selling part of it, you now effectively become an employee of your company. You, rep you report to shareholders, you report to a board, there's a lot of compliance. And if you're a creative entrepreneur, that stuff will drive you insane. Okay? Because entrepreneurs are used to running their own show. They don't like to be told what to do. They don't like answering to anyone. Another way you can raise a lot of money, I'll give you a quick, there's heaps of ways you can raise a lot of money. A lot of people say, I, I need this, I want to start this business, but I don't have the capital or I don't know how to do it. A very simple way to raise money is uh, more attractive. You can do a thing, jot this down, and you'll hear this has been talked about a lot, is what we call convertible notes. Okay? A convertible note is this. It's another tool you can use to raise money for your business. Now, you'd obviously need to know how to do this. You need lawyers, etc., to draft up correctly. But... I'll give you an example. In, I've um, recently made two companies of, oh, actually one, the second one will be becoming available soon, turn them into public companies. They're called publicly listed companies. They're not listed on the stock exchange yet. But we're raising what's called pre-IPO money for a company that's either going to be trade sailed or listed down the track where you raise money. What pre-IPO is where people get in before companies list or before they're sold off. Okay? Um, usually sophisticated investors are generally the people that get access to different companies to doing that. So what we did on one of my companies, which I'm raising capital for at the moment, it's a media company. It's a company that I acquired last year and I'm building, um, buying different assets. So we're raising capital to expand the business. So what we do to make it more attractive to investors, we do a convertible note. So in the example, convertible note might be this. It's basically like a coupon or you know, like a, uh, a certificate which says the note, basically a note. What's a piece of paper? Sorry, what's money? piece of paper. What's a share certificate? Piece of paper. What's an invoice? What's your pay slip? Okay. That, that's what money is. Basically, you're creating money, a convertible note. Convertible means it's a note that says you can buy shares in a particular company at a particular price at a particular time in the future, i.e. that note will convert to shares in a company, i.e. you're raising your company at a particular price in the future at a particular time. So for instance, what we do in one particular uh, company, we're offering 9% per annum. So in other words, a, a note holder that buys one of these notes gets paid 9% per annum, and you can be 10%, it can be 15%, it can be 6%, whatever the note is offering as far as a return and for whatever period of time. In this example, it's 15 months. This is for a media company that I own. 
15 months, 9% per annum. So the note holder gets 9% for 15 months. Then it converts, convertible note, to shares at 10 cents in 15 months' time. Does it make sense? So what that means is that you can, another way to raise capital, you can either just issue shares and you have to find investors or invest in shares, or you can make the uh, raising more attractive to investors and you'll hear the market talking about convertible notes at times. You go, what the hell is a convertible note? You know, it confuses you. All it's talking about is a note, it's a piece of paper that will convert to shares at a future time in the company. Warren Buffett's done very well out of convertible notes. Because what he did is that when he was bailing these banks out, he took some notes to say, I want guaranteed return. Why I'm putting billions into you banks that need it. I want a guaranteed return and I want it to be able to convert to a stock price that I want in a certain period of time. So he has both options. If he doesn't want to convert the stock, he had the option. Con doesn't want to convert it, he's still getting paid good premium, but the option to convert it as well. So then if the stock price does recover, He's able to buy it at, say, 10 cents, and the stock price goes to two, three dollars. He can convert and get it at 10 cents. Making sense? So it's a very good clause for him to have in this. But he's saying, I'm not just going to give you money. I want a return as well. So I don't know how much he was getting, probably 10 to 14 percent on his billions of dollars investor, and then it still converts to stock. Powerful tool. So as an example of that, it's a faster way to raise capital. There's many ways to raise capital. That's one way. Make sense? So quickly, I'll tell you a little bit about Business Academy. You'd each have a brochure uh, about Business Academy and a few things in there. It's not for everyone, but those who seriously want to take their life to a new level and if you want to make serious money in the future. Uh, you can make a lot of money either having your own business or you don't have to be in business for yourself. A lot of people think you have to be in business for yourself to become wealthy. I've already highlighted in this session that you can become a more successful manager or partner up with successful entrepreneurs and help them grow their companies, okay? You don't have to have your own business for yourself. Some of you want to start your own business, some already have your own business, some of you want to become better entrepreneurial managers, okay? So the program will be uh, next year. The first one will start in February in Melbourne. There'll be one in the Gold Coast as well uh, later in the year. Uh, we only do two a year. Uh, it's a three-day event, live event. I do 70% of it, and I'm also inviting in a few um, business experts on different areas that can help you with particular areas that you might want to um, be able to implement. I'll bring a capital raising expert at, as an example for those who are looking to raise capital for a business idea or to exit out of your business. Uh, I'll bring in um, one of my, um, someone off my board, successful entrepreneur, sits on uh, some of my boards where he can share his knowledge of business, etc., and different viewpoint. I'll bring other people that are experts in different areas that are important for business. Okay, but majority I'll be teaching live. Uh, Melbourne, February next year will be the first time to do that. Um, how much is it to do that program? Uh, depends whether you're a member or not. Um, there's there's some discounts available for you today because it's a, you know, it's a new program. Jot this down. If you're a 21st century member, so those who are watching this at home on DVD, uh, this is the price that it will be uh, in 2011. As a 21st century member, it'll be a $7,995 program. It includes a series of home studies with that program that's shipped to you straight away. So you can start studying those things before you come to the event, so you can get underway with your knowledge. Um, and if you're not a 21st century member, it will be a $9,995 program program okay however for the people here not the people at home uh, you'll be able to get some substantial discounts for 2010 you'll be able to enroll into this program as a member for only um, two thousand nine hundred and ninety five dollars if you're not a 21st century member it will be four thousand nine hundred and ninety five dollars you can take it on a payment plan as well and pay that over time you don't have to pay it all up front okay uh, also, what we will do at this level here, uh, your 21st Century 5-year membership will be included as well okay, uh, in that package. So if you're thinking about doing that anyhow, that will be included as part of that. Does it make sense? Guarantee is this. It comes with a $250,000 guarantee. Basically, what I'm telling you is this, is that you don't believe you can make or save at least a quarter of a million dollars in the ideas, strategies, concepts that you will learn at that event and spending three days with me teaching you everything I know about business and the other experts that will be coming in, then you have up into, I think it's dinner break day two, something like that, it's on there. Dinner break day two, I just hand back your materials, it costs you nothing. 
Make sense? Who's excited by that? So basically, you will learn ideas, you'll make or save, know how to make or save an extra quarter of a million dollars. You be the judge of that. Okay, some of you, just a single idea in the next five, ten years that you can pick up from that event can make you millions. But it's only a few hundred thousand. There's a lot of potential of things that you just don't understand and you don't know that can make a huge difference. So that's, that's the promise for that. Um, so there's no risk to it. What will it cost you if you don't know this stuff is probably the more important question. Okay, very good. So look forward to seeing some of you there if that's for you. What I want to do, we're going to have a very short in-room break. But in this in-room break, what I want to cover for this, not for everyone, but if you want to stay in the room, uh, I think Eric spoke to you a little bit about Coach the Coach program yesterday for some of you that, that uh, who'd heard about that. In the, I think in lunch break or something, we talked about that. I'm going to just um, spend five, ten minutes talking about that very briefly. I know many of you had extra questions on that. Just what we're looking for. We're looking at 21st century to you know, release the coaching program to teach people who want to build a coaching career, how to go out there and coach others in a lot of the strategies that we teach and build a uh, successful coaching business. And also we're looking out of that to recruit uh, potential people, the best of the best, to come work with 21st Century as either a financial coach or success coach or business coach, um, the different areas of coaching that we require people um, to work in our organization. 